Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 327. Nonverbal communication as a way to project confidence, competence, and professionalism. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. I've always contended that children learn the hardest lesson they ever learn before they start school. And it's amazing. I mean, people say, oh, my kid had struggles in school. My kid has trouble learning. Uh, and I always say back to them, maybe it's a matter of how you approach it or, or, you know, they may need certain additional skills, but they've already learned the hardest thing that they will learn. And that is to speak and understand appropriately in the English language. That, it's just a, an incredibly complex and difficult language That's why to we learn. have parents. And they learn it. They learn it from their friends. They learn it from the television. They learn it from church and the neighborhood and what have you. But they also learn to speak another language that doesn't really get acknowledged. And that language is the language of nonverbals. Mm -hmm. Children learn as infants to read their mother's tone and face and posture and body language. And they learn to try to manipulate it. Mm -hmm. so that their mother is pleased with them and smiles at them. They, they try to uh, seduce her when she's angry or upset or right. not available. They don't have avoidance. language. They don't I mean, have at language. first they don't have language, so that's how they have to learn. Exactly. That's how we all learn. And, and we do. And so we all learn to communicate nonverbally. And, and I often get English teachers in a dither because mm -hmm. I regularly say one cannot not communicate. I mean, you can sit here quietly and not say anything, but you're communicating. You're con communicating by your attitude, by your posture, by your aura, by your facial expression, your breathing rate, whether you're tapping your toes or, or your uh, fingers are playing. Or, you know, there, there are all kinds of things that are going on. And the challenge with nonverbal communications is that, that we learn it as children and we learn to recognize it and we internalize it and automate it. And then we rarely consciously think about it again. We just exist in a milieu uh, of, of our surround of people that are communicating. I mean, I go to a restaurant because, because I'm somewhat trained to do this and, and I'll go to a restaurant and I'll look around and I'll say, those people Don't go over to there a restaurant are, with Brett. <laughs> those, those people over there are fighting. Those people over there are happy. Those people over there are upset. This one is really sad. Something's going on with that one. Uh, and my wife, when, I, when we first started dating and I would do that, she'd be like, how do you know this stuff? And now she's learned how to do it and she, she can do it too. Did you notice these people over here? Uh, but it's it's very important for me because I read patients. I don't necessarily read people in a restaurant, although I guess I could. You do. But you can't not do it. You see yeah, somebody see that's it. got a goiter problem. You yeah, see somebody well, that's, that's true. A walking heart attack. You see somebody that's pale and doesn't have any blood flow. That's <laughs> obese. That's that's having trouble breathing. They don't want to know. You're doing diagnostic <laughs> checklist. I am. But you don't go up to them and say, "Do you know you're about to have a heart attack?" But you, thank God, you turn to me and say, "They got some walking heart attack." You know? <laughs> But, but it's not polite, and it's probably not wanted to, to say anything about right. it, but you still observe it. And I, I learned how to read a patient that way mm -hmm. in medical school, but I also knew how to do that anyway because we learn it as children. But we can hone that, that uh, kind of talent. I know that when I was an expert witness, I don't do that anymore, but as an expert witness for OBGYN for deliveries, mm -hmm. I learned from the attorneys how to sit so that I looked like I was paying attention and how to keep my shoulders back and look confident yes. because I am the expert at that time. I yes. was the expert in the room. And so I learned that from them, but I also had done uh, a lot of TV stuff. My daughter did as well, mm -hmm. TV and radio and when we were younger. And I learned how to walk and how to sit and how to stand and how not to look fat on camera and, you know, that kind of thing, you know, how the different angles and how to cross your legs. That was all in learning how to do how modeling. To communicate an image. Modeling. And a message. And it's all about image. It's the very first, the initial contact with somebody is the only thing that's going to ever matter. How they walk in the room and see you and how you see them 
is what they remember forever. It's implanted. It's in that book, Blink. Yes. By, by Malcolm Gladwell. Gladwell. Mm -hmm. The very first second, they know how who you are and how they should re respond to you. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. That's right. You don't. And things that you can learn, for instance, uh, if, if you encounter me for the first time and I am pleased by what I experience from you, the messaging mm -hmm. that I'm receiving from mm -hmm. you, the pupils of my eyes will, will enlarge fractionally. If you're close mm -hmm. enough to see them, I can't make it not happen. do that. No, <laughs> you can't I, not do I can't it. You can't make it, it happen. Yeah, yeah, I can't fake it either way. Mm -hmm. If I don't like what I'm seeing or if I'm upset or mm -hmm. off put by something, mm -hmm. then they will scrunch down. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't last. I mean, it doesn't endure. It's not like 30 seconds. You know, where you're it's really not everybody. Change. There's some medications that stop that. And there are some yes. medications. but So I just don't want anybody to think somebody doesn't like them if their eyes aren't dilating. Because no, I, that's just, that's a little, um, there are several things that a lot of people take that would stop their eyes from dilating. In any case, sorry. That's true. And and that brings me to another point to make, which is we learn these things about nonverbal communications and they're global. Uh, you know, you read books on it, uh, you study, you take classes on it, whatever, and they'll teach you broad gesture messaging. Uh, you know, like if somebody's sitting with their arms crossed uh -huh. or their legs crossed, that's called a closed <clears throat> posture. And the message is they're resisting or avoiding whatever your message is. I'm not is. believing anything you say. That's, yeah, that's exactly. like that. And, Teenagers but, do that a lot. But that's <laughs> not in and, and nonverbal communications are very important, very useful. You need to consciously be aware of as many of them as you can be, but you can't apply them globally. So anybody that you see with your arms crossed or their legs crossed, may not be rejecting you. They, they probably are. That's what you have to check out and find out. But it could be that they're uncomfortable, that they need to go to the bathroom, that they're cold, that uh, they're upset, that their stomach hurts. Women I mean, you, have to cross our legs if out, they have a dress on. Yeah. So, so you have to find out individually, is this true for this person? Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't make global predictions and, and say, well, everybody does this, and that means X. Mm -hmm. It's not that simply uh, standardized or codified. But there are things that are, as you said, learnable and codifiable. How you hold your uh, shoulders, how you hold your head, and whether or not you make eye contact, uh, if your voice tremors and quakes and quivers when you try to speak, from nervous energy, from embarrassment, from awkwardness, from uncertainty. And the reason that we're talking about this, we recently did a, a training course that Dr. Maupin runs to teach other physicians who want to practice the way that she does. And part of our discussion with those physicians was around the, the issue of uh, the controversial nature of doing testosterone replacement and hormone replacement in, in, within the larger medical community. And that they're going to be criticized or attacked by some physicians for the way, uh, for, for the way they practice medicine. And that it is in their best interest to learn how to present themselves as confident, competent professionals. That nonverbal messaging that goes out mm -hmm. is critical. I mean, they may know everything they need to know about the science and the mechanics of the procedures uh, that they could pass a test on it or get licensed or certified or any of that. But they're going to have to be able to convince people in their community, their patients and other physicians, that they know what they're doing. It, it's why we we watch things on YouTube mm -hmm. and go, oh, no way, because the person that's explaining something or giving you the information looks unsure or looks or or it, they may just be introverted instead of extroverted, but they look like they really don't know what mm -hmm. they're talking about. So we immediately go, oh, well, I'm not watching that because that person looks unsure. We're not going to believe what they say. Right. So we were trying to talk to these physicians or these nurse practitioners about how to, now you know the information, right. now you know, and you know you know, and you've seen the data, and you have the backup, and you know what you're doing, now you have to act like it. Right. Because no one's going to follow a leader who who looks insecure or looks like they're worried about it or concerned about something that that isn't even there, basically. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good things about testosterone treatment and pellet therapy is the best way to give testosterone and the lowest risk. But you have to know that. They know it. Mm -hmm. They have to look like they know it. Right. And they have to communicate it both verbally and nonverbally. This is what we were talking <clears> about. <throat> the the nonverbal, there's been some studies done. Years ago, a man named Albert Morabian uh, did a study and 
concluded some data that's been pretty consistently validated for 30, 40 years about nonverbal communications. And they talk about what are called uh, direct conversations as opposed to mediated conversation. A direct conversation is a conversation between you and I. It's a complete mm -hmm. exchange. I say something, you say something, we both mm -hmm. acknowledge or understand what's been said. Mm -hmm. A mediated conversation is a conversation that uses some other device, like a telephone or a television or a radio or some, some uh, external piece of equipment that the conversation passes through. So I can't see your nonverbals on mm -hmm. the telephone. Unless mm -hmm. I, I, we're doing FaceTime mm -hmm. now, that's a new technology that's available. But uh, I, I used to laugh when I was teaching this in, in college to people that wanted to be therapists, because I make the point to therapists that as a clinician, you have got to learn to read consciously and deliberately as part of your database information, the nonverbals of your patients. You've mm -hmm. got to be able to li listen to their story, listen mm -hmm. to their words, but also read their body read their state of tension, their state of relaxation, uh, where they hesitate, where they pause, what they avoid, when they when they digress somewhere else from a It's really important in doing any kind of interview. Yes. To and understand, you, you and I, I do that as well. You have, right. and, and how to take people who, like my mother-in-law used to, God, I loved her. She she used to just go off on a tangent and we'd say, those are the begats. Come back to, come back to what you're talking about. She'd say, now, this person, then she'd give me 30 people that she was descended mm. from. Yeah. And then she'd tell me about the story. I'm like, skip those people. I don't know them. <laughs> and I Just, don't care. They're not yeah. relevant to the right. message. So you have to bring people back. I wouldn't do that with someone else. No, you I wouldn't knew be her, rude about it. But, but, but the, every conversation has right. to do with who you're speaking to, how intimate you are. Mm -hmm. And if it's a stranger, stranger, or if it's a friend, friend. And those conversations are in context. But you're right, when very right, when you, and so is that researcher that said, you can't see, I can't see you when you're, when you are looking at this program, right. I can't tell if you're nodding your head or if I'm not getting through, I can't. Or if you're rolling your eyes and sometimes you can hear your adolescent roll his eyes yeah, from another room Dang. <laughs> because yeah. of all the nonverbals that right. you know from your, but, or your husband. You but know. what, but you know, one of the things that I have a hard time with, and that's why I don't like to do them is phone consultations with a patient. Right. I don't know. Right. So I, and even worse is a, an email that you lose all of the, right. in, the There's inflections. No There's no context. With an email, you, all you've got is what's written. You can think somebody's angry by how they write right. and they're happy. You can't tell right. by many of the things. So, so really seeing and hearing someone's voice is integral to understanding who they are and if they are understanding mm -hmm what you're trying to tell them and who you are. So you should do your phone consults now on FaceTime, FaceTime or some or Skype. I have to or do something, something yeah. yeah, that is um that a visual is, medium. Right, but it ha yeah. but it ha no one can but it's gotta be simultaneous. It's still yes. not the mm -hmm. same. It's not as good as sitting down in a room with them. So what Albert Morabian and Ken Cooper came up with in terms of understanding a direct communication, mm -hmm. they said that the verbal message itself consists of uh, 7% of the total message that's sent and received. Only 7% wow. of the words. So, for instance, as a child growing up, I was required, my, my father required me to say, yes, sir. Or if I really wanted to, I could say, yes, sir. Those were the only yes, options yes, that sir. I had. I could say, yes, sir. So the literal words that were communicated, yes, sir, whole message. 7% of the total message. The 93% <laughs> of the message was communicated by facial expressions, tone of voice, gestures, body language. So I could say yes, sir, to mean, yes, I have heard you and I understood. I could say yes, sir, to mean I enthusiastically embrace what it is that you're asking me to do. Mm -hmm. And I could say yes, sir, to mean no way in hell. <laughs> uh, it's not happening. I'm not going to do it. And so we're going to have a conflict. Mm -hmm. And then depending on how he read my yes, sir, uh, and all of you who have children will have seen this. Mm -hmm. uh, he would attack me or assault me based on, you know, <laughs> you, you think you're a smart aleck. Don't talk to me that way. You get that look off your face, you know, those kind of things. And then I would do the classic teenage gesture with the open hands raised and the eyebrows raised and all the nonverbals going, what? I didn't, you know, I don't mean that. Of course, I just, I said, yes, sir, which is what you require me to say. Women usually knew. just roll our eyes and walk away. <laughs> yeah, often yeah. they do. Yeah, yeah, and we don't even know we're doing it. Mm-hmm. Very, very regularly, people don't know that they use those gestures and, and uh, to communicate their attitude or their expectation or their assumption or their reaction. So it is 
interesting to start to try to be conscious of that. And this is what the, the breakdown that Cooper and Moravian found. 38% of the communication comes from tone, inflection, and attitude, what they call paralinguistic elements of it. So the tone or pitch of your voice, mm -hmm. the inflections, oh, sure, oh, sure. And two totally different messages, mm -hmm. same verbal content. Mm -hmm. So those things make a difference. 55% face and body language. That's why I can't understand people over the phone. Exactly. I can't get them. Over half of any directly communicated message that you exchange is face and uh, body language. So what, how, how does that play out in a counseling environment? What people often learn to do is, is mask their face. They can hold their face still and try to not show you uh, facial expression. They can't mask their eyes. So if you can watch their eyes, their eyes are still saying things, mm -hmm. even if their face is being still. Mm -hmm. uh, but how they purse their lips, how they hold their jaw, if there's a muscle that throbs in their cheek or their forehead, all of that communicates something. And what you have to do is spend time with an individual then to know what that is. And in my job, if I see something like that, I ask. I don't I see this. I don't know what mm -hmm. it means. What does that mean? Oh, nothing. Oh, nothing. I've always had that twitch. Well, then you say, okay, because you, you never call me a liar. You say, okay. Of course not. But generally when I experience that, it means this. So you're telling me that it doesn't mean that for mm -hmm. you. Okay, good. That's good information for me to know. Now I'll know. Do you mind if I check that out with you whenever I see it? You know, and, and, mm -hmm. and over that's time. A good, that's a good way to do over it. Over time, they start to recognize this happens when I'm ticked off or this happens when I'm afraid or, or anxious don't agree. or sad. Yeah, or don't agree. Uh, I used to, I, one time I saw a family, uh, husband, wife, and two daughters, teenage daughters. And they were all having some problems, and so we were working on their family issues. And one of the teenage daughters was the dominant person in the family. And that was a large part of the problems they were having in the family. And every time that I would try to get a discussion going with the mom or the dad, especially the dad, then the, the teenage girl would reach over and touch the dad on the knee because she sat catty corner to him. She would reach over and touch her on the knee, and he'd stop talking. So I started, I said, hey, I observed this. And they're like, no, no, that didn't, you made that up. Because but we don't know what we do. You don't know. We but do it so I started so pointing often. it out every time I saw it happen, not in a ha, gotcha, but no. wait, did I just see that? Did you just do that? Is it, what, what, what was that? Did you, did you feel that? And eventually That's they began to counselor. recognize. I couldn't be that patient. Well, you have to, again, <laughs> the message has to come in a non-threatening, non-aggressive, non-superior way. Uh, and, and so you learn to frame the message. But... When, you, when you're working with somebody that you don't know and you haven't learned yet, and they're masking their face and you don't know their eye expressions, then there are other things you look at. Watch their breathing. They can't regulate their breathing when they get angry or they get anxious. Mm -hmm. And so their breathing pattern changes. Uh, sometimes, I mean, one technique to help people that are having anxiety attacks uh, is to breathe with them. Have them match, you match paces with their breathing and talk to them and then have them slow down mm -hmm. with you. And that helps calm down their anxiety. Uh, you, you watch their knees. They cross or uncross their legs. They swing their foot. They tap their toes. Mm -hmm. They do things with their hands. They twist their ring. They turn their hair. All of those things communicate something. Mm -hmm. And the challenge then becomes to find out what. So that is usable. And this kind of information is usable for anybody in any set of circumstances in conversation. But as a professional, the point that we want to make today by talking about this, it, should you be a professional or should you encounter a professional? Or, but if you're an expert in any field. Yes. It, the quantitative database quality of your expertise may be superb. But if your nonverbals of confidence, competence, and professionalism aren't perfected, you'll never get your day in court. They won't listen to you. They won't credit you with any credibility. So how you carry yourself, your demeanor, your body language, your eye contact, your tone of voice, uh, your facial expressions, all of those things are things that you need to think about and talk about. Maybe as a teenager, you spend some time in front of a mirror, you know, primping and fixing your hair and putting on your makeup and stuff. I would encourage you to spend some time in front of a mirror learning to make professional statements that you're going to make regularly in, in your job. This is what I know. This is what my credentials are. This is how I understand this to be happening. What are my concerns? You need to be able to deliver that message in a hearable, believable, feelable way. Nonverbals really do matter. Uh, 
This is, this is key to being anybody. If you're the best barista in town, or if Absolutely. you know you're good at what you do, you don't have to be the expert. You just have to be, you have to have the confidence to get the, to get the raise, to get anything, and to get a, anything through. We all have something we want. We all have to have the confidence and show it in a way that's not obnoxious and not, I mean, we are not talking about being aggressive or no, overly assertive. All. We're talking about just having that about you that lets people know that you're competent at your job and that you know what you're doing. And if you're not, get competent and then act like it. One of the one of the more famous examples in literature is a character named Uriah Heep in uh, David Copperfield. And Uriah Heep was always washing his hands. Mm -hmm. he, and he was a slimy guy and he was doing dishonest uh, things. And that hand washing gesture is one that people recognize and feel off put by mm -hmm. if you do things like that. Yeah, if you have feel. some little mannerism mm -hmm. that you have developed as a way to drain off your anxiety or as a way to, uh, that, that you're not monitoring that's leakage uh, of what you really think or what mm -hmm. you really feel, uh, you need to learn what that is. And if that's in service of what you want to communicate, that's great. Do it. But if it's not in service, Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon was famous as a politician for never answering the question that he was asked, mm -hmm. answering the question he wanted to answer. But one of the, a lot of people one do of that. The, uh, yeah, <laughs> good, good politicians do that. But one of the things that Richard Nixon would do that if you go back and, and watch films of him, Richard Nixon's gestures were never timed properly. So he'd say, and that's another thing. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so, That's right. I remember that. It was so out of sync. You need to make it be in sync. You need to make it flow. <laughs> if you want credibility, if you want professional acceptance as an expert, your nonverbal posture and delivery is critical to your success. But if you're not a professional and you're just a person and you're in relationships and you have families, it's also useful and helpful to present yourself the way you want to be experienced. So learn about nonverbals and use them. You do it, you use them anyway, but learn about them consciously. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance Healthcast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.